UFP, the United Federation of Podcasts. Franchise Fatigue, the little podcast on the United Federation of Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brandon Shamutella, and joining me is my ever-constant zombie back from the dead, Zach Moore. How are you doing, Brandon? I am doing very good. I am regretting the decision of burying you and bringing you back, but we did have a podcast that we needed to record, so I really, truly felt I had no choice. Well, sometimes dead is better, but I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Excellent, right on. And today... We're starting a brand new franchise. We're hot on the heels of our first franchise, Mission Impossible, all done. We had our bonus episode on recapping the series, and we're starting fresh with a nice short little series leading up to the remake. Uh, we're doing Pet Cemetery, Pet Cemetery 2, and then the 2019 remake of the original. But we couldn't do it alone. And there was only one person that I had in mind for a guesting on this one here because he's got a very fascinating story that he's teased to me a few times, and I'm looking forward to hearing it. Our good friend, John Mills. How are you doing, John? Well, I, I, I'm here to assure you that sometimes dead is better and sometimes dragging <laughs> up memories from showings of movies where that line was said is is its own mistake. But uh, I promise to share the story with you, and I will. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Because we got your Halloween story when we did the Halloween podcast over for the Talk <laughs> Film Society there. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. you've, you've mentioned the Pet Cemetery story a couple of times. And, yeah. and, you know, I remember, like, these movies are supreme nostalgia. Like, my stepdad, Dave, was a huge Stephen King fan. And every Christmas, he would always get the new Stephen King book. He was always reading them. He had them on his shelf. And as I started to get older, I was interested, and I started to want to read Stephen King. So the first one that I read was The Dark Tower, and it was terribly boring, and it was no good. Um, and uh, in grade seven, a bunch of people <laughs> in my class were – it was boring. Then I started to appreciate no. it. So let me rephrase that. When The first okay, time I read okay. it, I didn't like it. But I le really learned to appreciate it and really love the books now. Um, but in, then in grade seven, all these kids were reading The Stand, and I tried reading that, but it was too long. And uh, I can't remember which was the first Stephen King book that I really finished. Um, but I do know that Pet Cemetery was one one that I came to later uh, as a novel, and I had seen the movies first because my sister and I, we liked watching scary movies, and we were always renting scary movies, and Stephen King was a big staple of ours, and because of the, the Stephen King books and the Stephen King and our family, like reading and stuff, we would watch Stephen King movies, and uh, this is kind of right at his peak, like in the 90s, he had a lot of he had a lot of things coming out, and so Pet Cemetery was 1989, which is a little too young for me. I think I was it was a few years later. I know that it was right around the time Pet Cemetery 2 came out, that we would have watched Pet Cemetery for the first time. So, you know, 90, 93, 94, somewhere in there. So I was 13 years old. But uh, I'm really looking forward to discussing this. Um, but before we discuss the film, Zach Moore, I'm going to guess that you dug up a whole bunch of great trivia. I did. I, I, I buried it, and it came back, <laughs> and and here it is. <laughs> so, so anyway, Pet Cemetery, all right, based off a novel, by Stephen King, right? Everyone knows that. Uh, but uh, the idea for this story came about when Stephen King's daughter's cat was killed on the highway outside of their home, and the cat's name was Smucky, and that name actually appears on a gravestone in the movie and in the book. But, you know, we're talking about the movie here, so it does appear in the movie. And uh, he was uh, he, he lived in the area where they shot the film. It was about, it was about 20 minutes away, so he was uh, on location for most of the shooting of the film. So he was very, he was very hands-on. Uh, during during this film, and uh, it's actually uh, it's actually the first film screenplay that he adapted from his, one of his own novels. So uh, he was out of most of the movies that he's ever been a part of, the, the movies that come from his work. This is the one he has the the biggest hand in, I would say. And he did mention that uh, the only novel he ever wrote that really scared him was Pet Cemetery. So I thought, I thought that was oh. an interesting comment from 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 the dark mind of Stephen King. This is the one thing that kind <laughs> yeah, of unsettled him. <laughs> And um, <laughs> he does make a cameo, as he often does uh, in his adaptations. Uh, it's, it's in the, he's the minister 
in the funeral scene. So keep an eye out for him. It's around 40 minutes into the movie, guys. And uh, there, there were a couple other directors that were talked about and considered uh, for Pet Cemetery. George A. Romero was originally set to direct, but when filming was delayed, he had to drop out. And uh, Tom Savini, you know, famous makeup artist from, you know, Dawn, uh, Night of the Living Dead, Land of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead, that, the zombie makeup guy. You all know his work. Uh, he actually declined the chance to direct the film. So Mary Lambert stepped in and uh, and she was actually friends with the Ramones. So that's why the Ramones has a song at the end of this oh. film and the sequel. She directs both films. Now, uh, this was her second feature film, but she was better known for her work in directing music videos, in, including you know Madonna's Material Girl and Like a Prayer. So this is big time huh. in the 80s, and, and that explains her connection with the Ramones. That's how they, they come across each other. Uh, so I'm just going <laughs> to interrupt and tell you guys that I've got like a special place in my heart for Material Girl. That's like one of my favorite songs. I just remember the controversy around uh, Like a Prayer. Like that, that video and that song, the video especially, was like, that was a major controversy magnet. Yeah, that's the one with the crucifix and all that. Is that yep. correct? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. There yeah. we go. I, Didn't I go know over my well interpretation. With some people. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so so Mary Lambert, when she came aboard, she insisted that Fred Gwynn be her choice for Jug Crandall. That was he. She was her first and only choice, and he's of course famous for playing uh, Mr. Munster in the Munsters. So uh, the parody Frankenstein. From the monsters is the wise, creepy old man in Pet Cemetery. So uh, I thought that was interesting. Uh, he is great in this film. We'll get into it, but but that that was brilliant casting. And the original cut of the film delivered to Paramount uh, was judged to be too long, so they cut out a lot of excess footage, and they decided the closing the closing scene was too tame, and they reshot it to be more graphic. So mm. you know, rated R, get mm. to get everything you can out of that. Uh, now, as far as the rest of the cast, Bruce Campbell was the first choice for the role a Lewis Creed that didn't happen Whoa. uh that would have been awesome i think yeah <laughs> so you know Ash versus the pet cemetery right uh but yeah. but that didn't happen and uh the role of Zelda which is uh, Rachel's sister was actually played by a man uh, Mary Lambert wanted her to uh be unsettling you know uh beyond just the fact that she was sick uh, so she didn't think a 13 year old girl was scary enough so she cast Andrew Hubestek in the role uh, to make something "quote unquote" off about her, uh, and that, and hmm. once you know that, you're like, "Oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense." <laughs> because Zelda's yeah. creepy. Um, now, during the opening credits of the film, there are several children's voices reciting you know, epitaphs for their pets, and uh, one of them is the voice of Jonathan Brandis, who is a star of It, the uh, TV adaptation of Stephen King's novel by the same name. So, hmm. there's his, his Stephen King connection coming in uh, even before a year before he started uh, in that film. And uh, the the young Gage in the movie, played by Miko Hughes. I, I know him best as the kid from uh, one of the kids from Kindergarten Cop, <laughs> but he's been in a lot of. He was in a lot of. Uh, he played all the kid roles in, the, in in this time. And uh, uh, critics of the film uh, were concerned over the violence factor of the of the film regarding regarding Miko or Miko, however you pronounce it, right? Uh, M I K O is how you spell his name. But uh, they, they were actually very careful to shoot and edit around that. Uh, they mm-hmm. shot all the, the the more disturbing elements and violent action uh, uh, with him not there, and they edited him into the scenes, and they used a child dummy for uh, most of the intense action footage. And, and I think you can tell. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I got some times. child's play yeah. vibes through some of the, some of the scenes <laughs> yeah. in the climax, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that's uh, that's the flyover for uh, for trivia on Pet Cemetery. See, I know Miko Hughes best from the masterpiece known as Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Yes, okay. Mm. So that's what he played. Mm-hmm. What is it with these kids and these horror movies? Yes. Uh, but uh, but yeah, he's uh, he's Nancy's uh, son in Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Yeah, ma- I did say masterpiece, John. I did. I, I I love that movie. That's the best nightmare movie in my opinion. So. John and I had a well, Twitter thing a little while ago, going back and forth about it. John is not a big fan. I, I it was not. meta before it was cool being meta. John, come on. I I wouldn't use the word cool in relation to New Nightmare. That's uh, I'll just offer that as my my tantalizing tease of an opinion on that one. I'm so. hoping to uh, I'm hoping to come onto your podcast later on this year for uh, retro perspective. Oh, please do. Week. <laughs> Please do. I'll take you and Schindler on. 
Awesome, right on. Hey, that's some that's some great trivia there, Zach. I love it. Um, yeah, this was a really good film, and uh, I did I watched uh, the bonus features. There was a few behind the scenes, and yeah, Stephen King actually specifically said that the movie had to be filmed there. Um, one cool thing that you didn't mention that I thought was really neat. Uh, well, two things actually. Um, the house that the Creeds live in is is the house like that's exactly what it looks like that's exactly where it is that property that lake in the background all of that is there but they actually had to dig up the tree from somewhere else and plant it there because there was no tree there so that was the only thing that that property didn't have and Hmm. the house was directly across the street from it but um they actually um uh for Judd's place. They, so they, yeah, they built a facade in front of that house. Over the yeah. front of it. Yeah. Did you say right. that? Yeah. Uh, no. But... No. Yeah. So I'm like, <laughs> but, okay, but... good. I didn't miss that, did I? Yeah. No. They put a facade over it, and then they burnt that. So they they there was a house there, but they created a fake front for it and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So anyway, well, we're done. I'll just jump into it here. I I have never seen either of these movies before. Okay. Uh, Pet huh. Cemetery One or, or Two. Uh, my dad was a big Stephen King fan until he read Pet Cemetery, and he told me he got about halfway through it. And threw it away, and never read Stephen King after that. So <laughs> wow, yeah, that's my only uh, wow. that's my only uh, uh, history with with these movies. Uh, but uh, I, I will say, you know, we're talking about all three of them coming out the remake. So we're talking about the first one alone. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised. I thought it was a very effective horror movie, and, and I love the casting of Judd, right, and the character. Yeah. Uh, I think like that, uh, hit, the actor and character make the movie he sets the tone he sets the vibe there's something you know there's always like there's a lot of stephen king tropes right here uh but like the the old wise guy who knows more than what else is going on right like he totally sells that and he plays it real well so him alone is like really his performance uh anchors this movie and when other stuff might be kind of like yeah i'm not too hot on this or that and we'll get into it uh i keep going back to to him for kind of like oh okay i'm interested i want to see more of this guy more what he's doing so that's, that's that's my first take on it. Yeah, like I've read the book, John. Like, what's your experience with this film? And have you read the book or anything like that? I have not read the book. Uh, when this came out, I, w- I was a, a younger lad, much younger, and um, went with a girl that I had something of a crush on to go see it. Um, and I think there was another friend there with us or something like that. We were too young to drive. And we weren't supposed to be going to an R-rated horror movie, we, you know. But movie theaters just don't care, uh, especially in the area where I lived in. <laughs> Nobody cared, and so we went in. And I, I actually remember the seats we were in. We were, uh, you know, I, I think it was like six rows from the back. It wasn't an over large theater. It was, all, it was in the days before stadium seating uh, and everything like that. And I remember sitting there, and the movie had me like from the get go. I was into it. I was creeped out by it. Now. As a young man, of course, and there's this girl I have a crush on that I'm seeing the movie with. I'm trying to be cool, you know. Hey, <laughs> I'm to be cool. the man. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, <laughs> I, you know, sure. I, I'm, I'm tough. I'm a protector, and uh, we're sitting there, and it's getting more and more tense. And it, <laughs> went the scene, the pivotal scene where Judd's looking for uh, our undead child, mm. and he, he, you know, he pulls out the. Uh, the switchblade and he he's looking around and then you see that little hand come out with the knife the scalpel and yeah. cuts into his achilles heel i spin around screaming with my hands <laughs> over my face ah! and i sort of realized in that moment because i could i wouldn't turn around till she told me it was okay to look back i never even saw the cut on the mouth until oh. years later <laughs> like i was just cowering in my seat and it was a very humbling lesson at that point not to try to pretend to be something you're not. <laughs> and uh, nothing really progressed with that girl after that showing, uh, but we remained friends. So there you go. <laughs> did, you ever, yeah. did you ever address that topic again years later? No, no, it was it was never spoken of again. <laughs> but uh, still, when it comes to that moment in in the film, it's still something where I chuckle because I'm like, oh, I remember, I remember that moment. You know, theater is... stories from, from John. <laughs> yeah. Yep. What is it yep. about feet? You know, like that scene really gets me too. That Achilles heel yeah. cut. Like, well, I don't know what I, it I is think... about that. I, I I think they're in the movie it being kind of gory to a point, right? 
But th- yeah. that was like, oh, whoa, we're at a whole other level of gore now, I, I think, like at that point. And then you know, yeah. the climax, it kind of keeps escalating. But like the whole Achilles tendon it just goes through the foot like a knife through butter. Mm. It's like, oh, my mm. God. it's it's That was terrifying. And then, of course, across the face, it uh, oh. was just, oh, oh well, poor Judd. <laughs> Yeah, you make a good point because, like, the violence that was in there before is really, I don't remember. 